60 Minutes, Rewind. Ten years ago, the Exxon Valdez, a super tanker carrying 53 million gallons of crude oil, ran aground in the pristine waters of Alaska's Prince William Sound. It was the worst environmental disaster in United States history, killing more wildlife than any other previous catastrophe. On top of that, some 60,000 Alaskans, most involved in fishing, say the oil spill hurt their lives and livelihood. The disaster cost Exxon $3.5 billion, much of which went towards a massive cleanup effort. And if you talk to Exxon officials these days, they'll tell you that Prince William Sound has recovered and that everyone hurt by the spill has been compensated. But if you go back to the Sound, as we did last month, and talk to the people who live there, you'll hear another story altogether. This is the beach at Sleepy Bay, about 65 miles downwind from where the Exxon Valdez ran aground. Take a look at all of this and you get a sense of the pristine beauty that is Alaska. But turn over a rock on this beach and you're likely to find oil. And government scientists say that that oil from the spill is as toxic today as it was 10 years ago. So that's the oil right that's there. That's the oil, that's leaking up from underneath. And that's, that's toxic stuff. So it's like a little little land toxic landmine. Bruce Wright heads a task force looking into the Exxon Valdez oil spill for the National Marine Fisheries Service, a federal agency. You sure this is Exxon Valdez oil? It's Exxon Valdez oil. There's no question about that. Wow. You see, that's all tarry oil. And you can you can smell that. Oh yeah. You don't want to smell, smell it too much because it's real volatile still. And this whole expanse of beach is covered with this stuff. This isn't the only place you'll find it here? You'll find oil on lots of beaches in Prince William Sound. The oil we were shown at Sleepy Bay spilled into Prince William Sound March 24, 1989, just after midnight when the Exxon Valdez, a ship the size of three football fields, ran aground on a reef even though the reef was plainly marked on charts in the wheelhouse. Eventually, oil from the tanker's ruptured hull spread over 1,300 miles of Alaskan coastline. The death toll was staggering. A quarter of a million seabirds, 3,000 otters, hundreds of bald eagles. And despite Exxon's attempts to clean up the mess, government scientists say oil from the spill continues to take a toll on marine life in Prince William Sound. The fish on the left is a normal pink salmon, and the fish on the right is a pink salmon that's been exposed to low levels of, of Exxon Valdez oil. So that bulging is the result of, of the oil spill? That, that bulging is the result of, of exposure to oil, yes. Usually leads to death of the fish early on. And are, are there salmon that look like this in, in Prince William Sound today? You could go out and find salmon that look like this in the oil part of Prince William Sound. However, Exxon officials continue to insist that oil from the spill is not responsible for long-term damage to marine life in Prince William Sound. And they say that the vast majority of species were never affected by the spill or have fully recovered. But according to a government report released last month, 21 out of 23 species have yet to recover. And while government scientists say they cannot prove it. Many local fishermen argue that the spill is to blame for the current shortage of certain fish in Prince William Sound. We used to have 275 boats that fished uh, in the fishery every year out in the Sound, and now you've got about 90 to 100 boats that participate. I mean, uh, half the fleet's gone bankrupt. These fishermen from Cordova, Alaska, say that lingering effects from the oil spill have caused a sharp decline in herring herring that were once abundant and provided a good living for Ross Mullins, who has fished in Prince William Sound for the last 35 years. When we're out here on the water, this really looks pretty nice. Yeah, it is, it's nice. I mean, it looks nice, but there's a big difference. And the fish that don't show up, how are you gonna look out there and see, huh, those fish didn't show up, you know? And when you hear Exxon say that we've spent a couple billion dollars on this cleanup? They've spent the money. They came in here and they put thousands of people on the beach uh, cleaning up rocks and that sort of thing. But there's still oil out there. Sylvia Lang, who's been fishing commercially since she was a teenager, 
says the shortage of fish since the spill has caused the value of their state-issued fishing permits to plummet. A permit cost $300,000 in 1988 because you could probably gross that in 1988. It's worth $27,000 now because you're lucky if you get that now. And the depreciation in the value of that permit you attribute directly to the oil spill. Without a doubt. The story will continue after this. These fishermen got hammered, and they're still getting hammered. Brian O'Neill is the lead attorney representing the Cordova fishermen and tens of thousands of other Alaskans in a civil suit against Exxon and Captain Joseph Hazelwood, who was the skipper of the oil tanker when it ran aground. In 1994, a jury determined that both Exxon and Captain Hazelwood had acted recklessly. The general public, what I can see, perceives me as some drunken fool. After the spill, Hazelwood, who now works as a clerk in the Manhattan law firm that represents him, was accused of being intoxicated and not at the helm of the tanker when it ran aground. A simple question. Were you intoxicated that night? No. You did have some drinks before the ship left port, though? Yes. How, how much did you have to drink? Three drinks and possibly a sip of the fourth. Perhaps a fourth sip of what? Vodka. On the Vodka. Rocks. Your license to drive a car was suspended at the time yes, of the grounding. That was because of a drunk driving conviction? Yes, from six months prior to that. It, it seems a little incongruous that you can't drive a car at home, but mm -hmm. you could pilot a tanker. Well, the Coast Guard took no exception with it, and it was something that occurred in my personal life. It had nothing to do with my job. Hazelwood was acquitted in a 1990 criminal trial of having been intoxicated while piloting the Exxon Valdez. A blood test that initially indicated he was drunk turned out to have been mishandled. He insists the grounding of the supertanker was the result of a simple mistake. You're on the way. Okay, thank you. To see just what that mistake was, we took Captain Hazelwood to this simulator which is used to train ship captains. Programmed into the simulator was this view from the bridge of the Exxon Valdez 10 minutes before it ran aground. The tanker was heading for a reef marked by a blinking light on the horizon, which we highlighted. Hazelwood says he left the ship's third mate with instructions to make a right turn away from the reef when the tanker was abreast of what he says that night was a clearly visible landmark. So all you have to do is get even with that. This light here that's coming and up. And you make a right turn. Yep. The third mate, who was granted immunity from prosecution, admitted he failed to execute the right turn, which had been ordered. At the time, Captain Hazelwood was in his cabin doing paperwork. When did you realize something was wrong? The phone rang, and as I picked up the receiver, he said, I think we're in trouble. And at that moment, I felt a shudder, and I got sick to my stomach. Physically sick? Physically sick. Because you knew? Well, I don't know if it was panic or terror. I knew something was dreadfully wrong then. And when could you actually see that something was dreadfully wrong? Well, as I walked out and came over and I could see the oil boiling up to the surface of the water. Do you personally think that you, you made any mistakes that night? Well, in retrospect, in hindsight being 2020, of course, I never would have left the bridge if I had any idea that what was going to happen. If you had remained on the bridge that night, do you think yes. the ship would have run aground? I don't think so. I, uh, I can't perceive me missing that turn. Captain Hazelwood will be heading back to Alaska this summer to begin a thousand hours of court-ordered community service. His assignment is to pick up trash from state highways and parks. As for Exxon, the jury that found the company had acted recklessly ordered it to pay $5 billion in punitive damages to the fishermen and others who say they were hurt by the spill. It's been five years since you won that judgment. How much of the $5 billion has Exxon paid? None of it. Nothing? Uh, not a cent. Why? They uh, have uh, spent most of the last uh, five years filing motion after motion uh, to get the judgment overturned. In all, Exxon filed more than 25 motions, prompting the federal judge overseeing the trial to express concern 
that the company will devise any possible procedural roadblock to defer payment of the judgment. The judge also expressed disappointment with Exxon's legal tactics, writing at one point, Exxon has acted as a Jekyll and Hyde, behaving laudably in public and deplorably in private. Exxon is appealing the case to a higher court. The judgment earns interest at about 6%, and Exxon makes about 18% on money that it invests. So by not paying, Exxon makes money. In fact, it makes so much money that by not paying, uh, the interest in about six and a half years will pay the judgment. How do you respond to those who say that you and your clients are going after Exxon because they are such a wealthy company? My clients and I sued Exxon because Exxon promised it would safely uh, transit Prince William Sound with oil, and Exxon made f a fortune off of that oil and Exxon didn't live up to its responsibilities and spill that oil and ruin an awful lot of people's lives. Although oil from the Exxon Valdez never actually reached Cordova, people who live here say it was a disaster that devastated this little town. Before the spill, Cordova had been among the top 10 fishing ports in the United States. Five years later, it had dropped to number 60. And social scientists who came here after the spill found significantly higher rates of alcohol abuse and depression. A former mayor committed suicide, leaving behind a note that blamed in part stress caused by the spill. Everything has uh, taken a, an impact from that 1989 spill. You still feel it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Jack Hopkins says in 1989, Exxon pledged to make fishermen whole. The company did distribute $25 million in Cordova that year. But he says the $60,000 he got has been nowhere near enough to cover his business losses and make him whole. I think what I am is in the hole. You know, I'm having a hard time uh, making boat payments and... But isn't fishing cyclical? I mean, don't you have down years and up oh, years? Oh, yeah, you do. But cycles are one thing. Total failures are another. And in these years of failures, you had Southeast Alaska, booming, biggest runs in history. You had uh, to the west, uh, you had strong runs, and here we had uh, failures. Exxon told us, and I'm quoting, those directly impacted by the spill were immediately and fully compensated. That's total BS. I mean, that's bogus. Exxon declined our requests for an on-camera interview, but the company did send us this letter, which says in part, the oil spill was a tragic accident, which we deeply regret. We are appealing the $5 billion punitive damage verdict because we believe it is unjust and excessive. They see themselves as a company that's already spent <clears throat> $3.5 billion on the oil spill. Why is there need for more punishment, yeah. more money? When you and I do something that the law says it, we must be punished for it, it's got to hurt. And they're not hurting. Their stock has tripled since 1989. Um, where is the hurt? Here's the hurt. The hurt is here in this little community that has lost its sense of future. We have the hurt. I don't see where Exxon has the hurt.